Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Saturday edition. What, we have Saturday editions? Of course we have Saturday editions. This is episode 516. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm the very large George Conger, and next to me is the very small... <laughs> <laughs> Diminished. <laughs> Okay, before we get too far into the show, we need you as an audience member, a viewer, a listener to Anglican Unscripted to like the show. Whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you find it, just click that little like button. It means a lot to us that we're liked. Uh, if you don't like the show, don't click on that you don't like it. That, that'd be ridiculous. Please share the show, send it to your friends. If you've not subscribed yet on YouTube and don't get that instant notification on your desktop that there's a new show, click the little bell that subscribes you to the show and you'll get instant notifications. Please comment on the show. Lots of great comments because sometimes, not often, like once every thousand episodes, we're a little wrong and need correction. We appreciate that. On to the show, gentlemen. We're going to do a follow-up to the... Uh, uh, I, I always have pron trouble pronouncing it. It's the Uwern camps uh, that we talked a little bit about the last week uh, with some characters who've done some really bad things. And if you see us look completely uh, bizarro as we're reporting this, it's because it's so hard to report this type of stuff. Who does these type of things? And well, it's so exciting because I think Gavin is on location now. Are you at the uh, Grand Chartreuse or <laughs> That's the uh, castle? We're doing a, almost a Da Vinci <laughs> Code type episode, and Gavin's in a French monastery somewhere. I'm on my way to Teze. It's, it's the anniversary of my ordination, uh, 38 years ago, and I'm uh, I've got to see a, a theologian in Burgundy anyway. So I'm going to spend a week saying my prayers in Teze and. Uh, and ask, ask, asking the Lord for a fresh anointing, a fresh, a freshness in whatever way He wants. But anyway, um, so I'm, I'm, I shall disappear for a week. In have, yes, have you found any uh, albino Opus Dei priests uh, in your entourage? Or, I mean, because this, folks, this is this is the level of the show right now. It's <laughs> yes. so wild. Okay, so can I also say that one or two people, quite rightly, were, are very uncomfortable with our, our our level of humor, and and so I want to apologize because. Uh, please put it down to, to psychological immaturity. The fact is that, that, that in my case, at any rate, uh, we're, we're dealing with things that are, are so literally bizarre, a combination of, of, of bizarre, corrupt, and indescribable. Um, and I guess there are a number of ways of responding emotionally. One would be fury. Uh, one would be complete incredulity. Uh, but, but another, uh, certainly from my culture, uh, one, one occasionally laughs. But but it's mainly incredulity, and it doesn't. It's not in any way intended to diminish uh, the the very serious discomfiture and damage done to people in the situation. But please forgive us if we don't process this as psychologically. Uh, um, Kevin, you're so do. English. You're starting <laughs> off the show for apologizing. I know. Well, hold on. In his defense, we we were doing this in pre-show, just speaking to the horror of what we're we're witnessing here. That what we have to describe. If I were a BBC uh, anchor on TV, there's no way I could hold a straight face reporting on this. That's how bad this is. And please understand, we know how bad it is. We're we're reading it. We're trying to say, how do we tell our audience what has happened in these you were in camps, uh, and tell them about the characters, tell them about who knew what when, and what this holds for the future. So it's the horror but let's start talking uh, I, okay. well let you, know, we, you guys sound like you're rehearsing for the part of marlon brando in apocalypse now going the horror the horror that the you're horror. you're up the creek you're up the river with uh, uh colonel kurtz at the end of uh uh of a uh, at the oh, big explosion yes <laughs> no but, but let's get on i why is gavin pixelated he's at the castle in france and he's using his ipad and this is just the best technology we can get uh we didn't have audio with him uh 10 minutes ago so we're going to uh, hopefully continue the show with that let's move on to the topics what give a quick update to what we learned over the last couple of days george the UN, uh, the UN crisis has uh, taken a major step forward. On Wednesday, the EMA, Ev Evangelical uh, Ministry Assembly, meeting at the Westminster Chapel in London, 
which is put together by the Proclamation Trust. It's basically a who's who of the evangelical English world, about a thousand odd people. One of the presentations was by Vaughn Roberts, where he had people from Emmanuel Wimbledon, their safeguarding officer, and an attorney uh, talk about Jonathan Fletcher, uh, the incumbent of that uh, proprietary chapel for over 30 years, one of the major figures of the English evangelical scene, what they have done in response to credible accusations of sexual misconduct. And so this came out and was publicly aired at the EMA. This, ha this happened the day after our broadcast and the three days after the Daily Telegraph's expose on Saturday. Since that time, there have been a number of major developments in this story, and it keeps getting worse. Um, there's some frankly bizarre aspects. The private eye, Gavin, tell us about private eye and what they're telling us is going on. It would be very interesting to know who who sent the piece to private eye because they're clearly in the know. But what they've uh, done who, is they've who is private eye? Pri private eye is, is one of our oldest satirical magazines. It essentially blows the whistle on political uh, um, uh, corruption and. It's, an, it's a way of getting truth out into the public space, if you have any truth. They constantly get sued for libel. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. Somebody has sent in a, a, a notification saying that Jonathan Fletcher uh, has a close friend who sits on the trusts. That, that first of all, they, they sit on some very wealthy trusts. But secondly, this close friend is, a, is a, an ultramontane Roman Catholic and connected with the Society of Pius X. Um, and, and then one of the things they say is that society has got into trouble with being associated with defending fleeing Nazis, but also with uh, associations for, for S&M practices. And so the implication is that Jonathan Fletcher's conservative evangelicalism is, is um, not as important uh, as what he has in common with his friends who run this Catholic Da Vinci-esque uh, society. I personally, I, I think I'd be so surprised if I'm not saying it isn't true, but I'd be so surprised if, if these were the right dots to link. I, I think it is so bizarre. Um, and, and what it suggests is that Jonathan Fletcher isn't as sincere about his very Protestant Christianity uh, as he and his colleagues have always said, because you, did, you described the, uh, the evangelical conference, George, as as the who's who for evangelicals, but in fact, it's it's a very particular group. It's it's the very conservative, very Protestant group, who make a great deal of their doctrinal purity. This isn't the, the this isn't the Holy Trinity, Brompton, the Alpha Group, or anything like. No, this is some way further to the. Let's use the left or right. Unfortunately, it's not very helpful. It's like it's quite some way further to the right of them. It, it's as far right as you can get before you become a very conservative Baptist. Okay, well, hold, uh, George, we didn't really allude to this last week. What is Jonathan, Jonathan Fletcher being accused of? Jonathan Fletcher um, is being accused of essentially abusing teenagers, boys. So far, the complaints have been against boys over the age of 18. 16. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, boys at the age of consent. Right meaning these aren't minors where it would be statutory rape. He's, con he's accused of engaging in homoerotic, sadomasochistic practices, beating naked boys on the bottom with a sneaker. One of the things that was raised at the EMA conference was that uh, Fletcher would give nude massages to, young, to these young men, and the young men then in the nude would give Fletcher a massage, who was also nude, um, that he also engaged in manipulating them spiritually uh, in the sense that sort of creating them as little uh, dependence, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually dependent upon them, creating almost a master-slave, a domination. domination. Uh, th and this is the angle that the uh, private eye wants to do. They're trying to link flagellation with extreme English conservative evangelicals with extreme Roman Catholics. Um, it's a fun from a newspaper point of view, but as Gavin says, I don't think that's really where it's going. 
So, George, so the I, I, allegations of uh, sexual <clears throat> misconduct, pastoral misconduct, were made uh, at the EMA. Now, Gavin, I, Fle Jonathan Fletcher has responded and said, yeah, but it, there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, it's a great way to save money. Is, is that, what, was that not the response? Yes, this is almost as ludicrous as, as, as the Da Vinci Catholic link. Um, Jonathan Fletcher did say that in the Church Times. It, it, this saved getting masseuses or masseurs in. Um, I, I, the, the problem with this is, again, one might laugh, but it's it terribly sad that he could think that this might somehow, uh, his rationalization of this, presumably to himself, might work for other people. I'd like to join the dots, though, in a very different direction. Um, when, in the early 1980s, uh, I was invited to a small select group run by Dick Lucas. Now, Dick Lucas is the grandfather of the present establishment. He was Vicar of St. Helens Bishop's Gate um, before William Taylor was. And it was a great honor to be invited into Dick Lucas's small group of, of kosher evangelicals. I didn't last more than, more than a few weeks because I asked questions uh, and uh, I got thrown out. <laughs> But the reason I mention it is not to talk about my own psychological wounds, which are quite light, but the fact was you could get thrown out or you could be invited in. And this is where the real psychological damage and the dynamic exists. Um, I once tempted to use words like, like cult, but that's not quite right. What you have is in a, in a group that was preaching the adoption by God of sons and daughters into a full relationship with the Trinity, the real method was, if you belong to the right group, you don't ask the wrong questions, you accede to our theology and our hierarchy, you can belong in a very, very special way. And the moment you introduce sex into this very, very special way, you cement people in a way, in, in, in a way that's highly dependent and enormously destructive. And that's the situation that, that we're dealing with. And that's the situation that needs to be called out. Some of the things that we've... Uh... I've, been, I've received uh, emails from a person alleging that he was one of the first-hand experience of uh, Fletcher's abuse. And one of the things that Fletcher did what would be very dismissive about uh, these young men forming relationships with the women their age, uh, trying to break up marriages, trying to basically tie them emotionally back into Fletcher, not allowing them to develop normal, healthy, uh, uh, the sorts of things that 22, 22 Heterosexual years. relationships, yes. And heterosexual relationships, but focusing all of that back into the relationship with Fletcher. Um, now, again, these are just allegations and I've not investigated them, but- No, but they're not, they're not just allegations, George. I have to be very careful what I said here, so please excuse me when I tread carefully. But one of the things that happens over, over a ministry lasting 40 years is that people come to you with, to talk through their marriages. Uh, and, and if I can just simply say that there are, there are people who went through this system who, as they carried through the, the disabilities that this kind of experience left them with, found themselves paying a very high price in their marriages later on because they weren't able to uh, engage in the imaginative flexibility that, that a grown-up relationship with a woman required. So I, I obviously won't say any more than that in case people think I'm talking about them directly, but um, the consequences of this um, go, go far beyond just belonging or not belonging. They leave people with a series of incapacities that last for a long time. Now, help me out here. His PTO was revoked, his ability to preach, teach, and officiate. Uh, at some point, somebody in the diocese he worked in knew what was going on and said, Okay, you're retired. We're not going to send you to jail, but boy, you're not going to be you know, preaching, teaching, or officiating anywhere in this diocese or within the Church of England. So that decision was made. They didn't really broadcast that Mr. Fletcher had lost his PTO. So most people had no idea. I didn't know. You guys didn't know. Um, but there's now links with GAFCON and the ACNA where he was at the commissioning service of Andy Lyons. Who knew well, what, who was there? Well, we've, uh, we've been, Gavin has raised the point that this culture, uh, 
basically puts the the uh, interests of the group, the cult, the leader, ahead of the wider interests of the uh, ahead of wider interests, of, including interests of right and wrong. And one of the things we have found is that uh, well, I'll explain it and then we'll characterize it. Jonathan Fletcher was suspended from ministering the Church of England in 2017. Uh, Wimbledon Parish, where he had been, knew this. Uh, they they stated this in their report to the AMA. T fall of September 2018, Andy Lyons, who was a product of Emmanuel Wimbledon and is one of, and who was abused spiritually by uh, Jonathan Fletcher, we've published Andy Lyons' statement to that effect, was consecrated in Illinois by Archbishop Jensen and the GAFCON leadership, and then he went to Wimbledon Emmanuel Wimbledon uh, very shortly afterwards and had a commissioning service where the minister at Emmanuel Wimbledon preached and guess who was up there on the dais doing a Q&A with Andy Lyons? Jonathan Fletcher. Jonathan Fletcher is not allowed uh, to hold himself out at, uh, or to, to officiate it. To, he has a license, he's under suspension, he's under suspicion of abuse and he's on the stage in this commissioning service. So my question to the ACNA and to GAFCON, did you know this? And they said, no, we had no idea. I, I believe them too. Because don't and, and what's happened is so that, and, and then I said, when did you know this? Well, we started hearing things later in 2018 and we only really knew in 2019 when this whole thing blew up and when Andy Lines began to tell us what you know the problem was. So, some but so the desire to protect the inner circle, the magic circle, the club of the chosen elite took precedence over the interests of the wider GAFCON AMIE uh, movement to have this man who basically is compromised, uh, whether or not his homoerotic uh, uh, boy toy games were criminal or not, they're certainly not what you want to have in the commissioning of the start of a new church organization. And they hid that, that information from GAFCON. I think one of the sad things too is, is it, it reflects very badly on, on English uh, Anglican Christianity. As I've said before in this program, I've always been very impressed by them, which Archbishop Foley Beach came to the English and said, ACNA wants to put together a composite enriched Anglicanism made up of sacramentalism, a love of the gospel, and an openness to the Holy Spirit. And I remember at a very important meeting, he laying, laying that down as a challenge. The difficulty is that perceiving the strongest and most articulate, and I have to say the wealthiest group, to be this one, uh, they then pragmatically made an alliance with this group. In terms of potency and power, I can see why they would do that, but it's backfired very badly. A number of us were uncomfortable with this because we knew that, that this group was a particularly close and narrow one, excluding anybody who really didn't belong, which was a lot of other people. <laughs> um, and we were sad, I think, that it became, was, it became clear that GAFCON, for uh, strategic, perhaps some theological reasons, uh, chose to use this group as the foundation for, uh, for GAFCON UK. It's backfired very badly. Uh, um, but but it, but it's it's hard to know what the solution was. The Jerusalem, I think you may remember, when the English evangelicals met at Gafcon, uh, amidst about I don't know how many people there were fifty people there. There were probably about thirty five different groups. <laughs> and, um, one of the things that was would would have been necessary was to be to find a way of drawing these disparate groups together. Certainly not to uh, empower uh, perhaps the most narrow and the most controlling group. Uh, it's been asked uh, in the previous shows, why was the ACNA a success and why hasn't AMIE not taken off? I have an opinion, and that is ACNA, everything was always done in the light. There was, it, it wasn't founded on a lie. And what we now have is AMIE's commissioning of its opening bishop was founded on a lie, a deliberate act not to inform the leadership of information that was vital to be known. Well, this, How in God's name can you expect any reputable organization to survive such a fiasco? You but, can't, I mean, this is, this is just incredible 
that uh, th these people would even hold their faces up and go forward. Well, it's not a GAFCON lie. It's not an ACNA lie. It's it, it's a lie. They were, the, they were the people who were lied to. They were the victims here. And if they're victims, it, it, it's atrocious. I, I think it's really important that we transition into talking about the victims and reaching out to them. There's a lot who haven't come forward yet. We want to encourage them to come forward, to seek help, uh, to get spiritual help in this. Uh, just like Mr. Fletcher said that well, there's nothing wrong here. A lot of you believe that there was nothing wrong uh, in what was conducted against you, and you need to, to, to get help in this. And but this, but this is such a comp. Yes, you're entirely right, uh, Kevin. I can agree with you completely that the victims of this predatory group need to be uh, need to be reached and supported. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the people who've written to me uh, past, you know, last week we met, last episode we did mention that a, an abuse victim said there were six active abusers at the Uwern camps, and we had to, and two of them were Jonathan Smythe, and the assumption was that Fletcher was number two. Well, they sent me a, a Telegraph article saying here's number three, and I won't go into the details because I've not researched the veracity of the Telegraph article to my satisfaction, but the essential was. That there was a young man, a peer in age of Kevin and I, a Gavin, you're 10 years older than him, who uh, was abused as a young boy and then as an older boy participated, participated in the abuse of other boys with Smythe and company. So an abuser, a victim, was also groomed to be an abuser and complicit. In, in the crimes of which he was also a victim. And, and I think this is the hard thing to ask. Um, when Andy Lines was brought to the United States, he was interrogated and asked, we understand you're a victim, but did you also become an abuser? And Foley Beach and Ben Quashi have cleared Andy Lines of any suggestion that he was victim abusing. He was a victim. We don't know that about some of the other leaders. We don't know that about some of those who have been so closely tied with this man, Fletcher. There are, there are three things we might draw out from there. One is, uh, as George quite rightly says, it, it raises questions about whether the, the man called Bash, because the UN camps were originally known as the Bash camps. Um, whether, I mean, I don't want to do what well be to, 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 uh, to George Bell, because Bash is dead now. But it raises the question about whether Fletcher, Doggett, uh, and um, Smythe learned this from the founder of the camp or whether they happened to introduce it, if you like, laterally. Be that it may, there's the great danger, as George quite rightly says, that those who passed this, allowed this crisis, they passed off as spiritual abuse, which is a silly euphemism and frankly shouldn't be used, uh, did so because they didn't want the full details to come out. Well, of course they didn't want the full details to come out. But I think that we, we can take a, there are two things, positive things we can take out of this. We've described what's wrong and it's really very upsetting, but, but how can we make it right? Well, the first thing is for these questions George has been posing uh, to be answered and for us to discover quite what level of condoning has gone on by the people who take over the reins of control in this small and very select uh, and powerful group. The second thing I think is, is that the original ACNA vision which Foley Beach brought to us, that renewed orthodox Anglicanism, ought to be modeled on uh, the, the whole spectrum of Anglican Orthodox spirituality, sacramental, evangelical, and charismatic. Uh, that was sacrificed to uh, ideological and pragmatic aims. Uh, and, and I suppose, I'm sorry to say, but a, but a kind of, um, uh, in order to produce a kind of Sydney Anglicanism in, in England, which was always going to be problematic because it would exclude so many people. It's been doubly problematic, as we've discovered. It, I think ACNA ought to try and broaden the tent properly uh, in a way that is congruent with Foley Beach's original vision. And then some good might come out of this crash. We might find ourselves with a renewed orthodox Anglicanism, which has some of the spiritual and ecclesial resources that ACNA has and has modeled so well for us. I, I don't think it's going to happen, Gavin. 
I really don't, because uh, this is my prejudice. But class, the class, the class issue is destroying evangelicalism in the Church of England, where this self-referencing, self-reproducing circle is only seeking to evangelize and proselytize other people like themselves. Um, now, it may be a strategy. The Jesuits have, are famous for doing this as well, of converting the elites and then everybody else follows. But what are the fruits of this ministry? The fruits of this ministry are what are we talking about right now? Sadomasochism, homoerotic games, damaged human beings. That's the fruit of this ministry right now. On that note, we've given our audience 30 minutes of uh, things to ponder. Uh, I don't want you just to ponder it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to pray for the victims. I want you to pray that this doesn't happen again within the Christian church. Uh, you know, this is horrid for Anglicanism. This is horrid for Christianity. This is horrid for our witness down to the world. People go to the telegraph and rip another bad Anglican story, another sexual predator released within the church. Um, oh, look what happened again in the 70s and 80s, just like we were told. It's just, it's another Monty Python parody of our church that we get to read about in, in the, the papers uh, in England. It's, it's atrocious. Kevin, let let yeah. me offer a brief piety. I, 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 I'm given to pieties. Mm -hmm. um, we've, been, we've been blaming people, and of course there is, a, there is a perfectly real element of personal responsibility. But from a Christian point of view, we know that our real enemy is Satan. And what Satan does is he looks for our weaknesses and he sets out man and woman traps and people fall into them. We're just, we are just, what we're describing is the way in which the Church of England has been trapped. The, the Catholic Church has, has, has fallen into these traps that our spiritual enemy, the principalities and powers, lays for us. But the good news is we get free by telling the truth and by repenting. So rather than point the finger at, at, at broken uh, people who misbehaved, what we should do is to remind all of ourselves that our salvation lies in honesty and repentance. And then the Holy Spirit gets to rebuild what we do. And, and, and there's, more, there's more hope for the kingdom, a proper foundation. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm an unhappy George Conger. <laughs> I'm, I'm a rather pious Gavin Ashenden. And you've been listening to episode 516 of Anglican, as usually, highly unscripted. Mm -hmm.